There are secrets out there, guys, performance marketing secrets, and knowing just one or two of them can light up your funnels. Let's go. This is Performance Marketing Insiders. I'm Chris Mechanic. Join me as we go deep into the secrets of the world's elite marketing minds. Performance Marketing Insiders is sponsored by Web Mechanics, the AI-driven performance agency that makes you smarter. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Revenue Driven CMO. I'm your main man, Chris Mechanic. Super excited to be speaking with today's guest. He's young, but he's experienced. He's smart. He's in a B2C environment. I know that most of the listeners here are B2B, uh, but B2Cs have something to teach to the B2B. So I guarantee you're going to learn something and get some good ideas and some good thoughts for this. He started at WebPT, which is a large uh, online physical therapy platform. Then he was at Gainsight for four years. Now he's head of growth and chief marketing officer at Postscript, which is an SMS based platform. And folks, I am bullish on SMS. I'm super duper bullish. I think there's applications for SMS and B2B. I think that you will see B2B start to adopt SMS on a much broader scale. And the reason for that is simple is because it's a much more intimate touch point in this day and age where emails don't get delivered, people are switching jobs, et cetera, et cetera. There's no more uh, surefire way to get in touch with somebody than, you know, literally the most, the most, uh, intimate device that they have that they carry around in their pocket. So folks, really excited to introduce uh, our guest today, which is Chief Marketing Officer at Postscript, an SMS-based uh, company that caters to e-commerce Shopify merchants. Meet Mike Mannheimer. Welcome to the show, Mike. Chris, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you, man? Can't complain. You're a B2B SaaS badass, and you did B2B SaaS for days you transitioned to the to the other side to the b2c side you learned about sms and now you are coming back to teach your b2b brethren the way (laughs) even though they're not on shopify and they can't use your particular product there is a place for sms and b2b dude you know it yeah for for sure and like um, and dude sms is so intimate like the open rates are a hundred percent you cannot go wrong with that yep Right. Yeah. No, I mean, there's, there's totally lessons that are applicable across the board. And, um, yeah. And, and then also like, I'm happy to share about like how, uh, in my career journey, going through all these different settings, like for example, you know, selling to, uh, Shopify merchants who make products that I buy as a consumer and I can touch them, feel them. There's, um, there's something really special about that. And like in, in my mind as a, as a, as a B2B marketer, I, there's so much more creative freedom by selling to folks who are selling direct consumer that yeah. makes the B2B equation a, a lot more interesting, frankly. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's really satisfying when, you know, you sell a three-year deal to Hewlett Packard enterprise and it's worth $25 million a year and everyone's high fiving and it's like three years to close it. Like I've done that. That's really fun really gratifying it's also really gratifying to like sell your software to an entrepreneur whose product is like in my fridge right now because they make like sauce and right. they're trying to achieve their dream and i'm a customer and like that's yeah. really cool too the connection from the software to to the product is um even it's more like, like oh visceral. i'm chatting with little dick's hot sauce yeah yeah totally yeah like let's you know, go i love little dick's hot sauce yeah, it's just cool. It's a cool I met a thing. guy in the airport recently who was like a e-com. He yeah. was like a big badass corporate banker or lawyer or something, but he had this e-com on the side called Bit or no, it was called Little Dick's Hot Sauce. Yeah. It was called it, Little you know, Dick's Hot Sauce. It, 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 B2B folks are also like you know, I learned this one joint. They're a little uh pretentious too, in some ways. There are plenty of businesses on Shopify that do mid nine figures in revenue every single year, you know? So we're, 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 we're talking about the journey to get to a hundred million in annual recurring revenue. Plenty of our customers are doing three, four, five. We have a customer that's going to do $750 million in sales this year, yearly. On Shopify. Not, 
Yeah. And it's not recurring. They have to go resell every single thing they get. Yeah. So it's a bottle of hot it, sauce, right? So it, there's a, I think that there's a, you know, a, sometimes B2B folks act like, you know, we're, we're like at the ivory tower of, of marketing. And it's like, you know, the, so are you long AF Shopify stock right now? Oh, a hundred percent. I, Cause they've been in the gutter. Yeah. You know, they, they're, they're, um, you know, they're in the same spot that everyone else is in. I believe in their, um, in the innovation that they're bringing to the table. I think they are for their size, um, for their size, Shopify is pound for pound more innovative in what the value they're bringing to their customers than any other company that's as large as they are that I've ever seen. They ship a lot of very, very valuable uh, software to folks. It all works together. And um, I think if you want to make a bet on e-com, which is a smart bet, e-com is growing every single year. Sometimes it grows faster than others during COVID, it exploded, but it's still growing. The trend lines up and to the right. If you want to make a bet on who's going to be able to capture a bigger piece of that pie as it continues to grow, Shopify's at the top of the list. And if you don't think that, I don't know what, well, who else you're betting on there. So you they're, are actually long Shopify, like you own Shopify stock in your personal account kind of thing. Oh, I mean, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I, I buy, nice. I, I buy and hold Shopify. The company, well, you know, PostScript just, you know, got a lot of really smart people in it too. If we weren't long Shopify, we would have gotten off their platform. Yeah, as fast you would as not be in that business. Right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah we a, really, we really believe that uh, they're going to make a, a run at the, um, at the enterprise that's likely to be successful. And, um, you don't want to do business with everyone in any commerce, but um, I'm a big believer that Shopify is, is going to be the, the winners when, when the dust settles in you so know, Mike, I like this vibe. We're just freestyling right now. Let's keep yeah, going yeah, yeah. on this vibe if that's cool. So you're here to teach us. So mm -hmm. you came from B2B. Deep yes. In the trenches of B2B, right? Yeah. That's your, that's where you came from. That's your home. You went over here to PostScript, which is exclusively B2C, Shopify yeah. only. So that's like the epitome. That's like the melting pot of B2C. What? Teach your B2B brethren, me, teach us, what do we need to know, like, about SMS? Like, like, and I know, I mean, I know a thing or two about SMS, right? Like, yep, yep. Yeah, I think um, the, the first thing that everyone, regardless of what setting you're in, whether it's you're selling to a consumer or you're selling to an enterprise in a B2B environment, is you have to first, like, figure out how to get over the fear. Um. SMS of, is of just it, simply it, sending an SMS. Yes, it, it's such an intimate, yeah, it's such an intimate channel that people are very fearful of uh, putting their brand in between like a text from your best friend and your spouse and your grandma. That's where you yes. gotta live as a marketer. There is a and fear. It's like that's too invasive. A hundred percent. Of course, I would never send that on a Saturday or Sunday. Yeah, a hundred percent. If I if I could muster up the cojones to send an SMS to one of my prospects, it would have to be Monday through Friday during business hours in their time zone, or else, yes, it's just oh, not yeah. happening. Totally. And so, I what I would say is people are 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 afraid to do it, so they hide behind the idea that like, oh, maybe my customer won't won't like this. Now we all know the answer to those types of questions in marketing test it so you got to get over the feet here you got to structure a test for your brand and figure out how to actually start doing it so you can get some feedback yeah the next the next thing that i think people um really get freaked out about and this is true the bar on like what constitutes good marketing on sms versus email or uh, ad uh or its ad channel or your website or whatever it's way higher so you have to be extra thoughtful. You can't just like mail it in. Like with email marketing, you get to hide behind the fact that like a lot of people don't even open your, right. And you know like that, this right? This is probably so like, not even going to be seen. Yeah. How many people are actually going to like freak out about this, this risk we took on email? It's, it's just way less risky. Whereas, you know, when, when you send someone a text, 
the, the sound's going to go off, the notification's going to come through. They're going to at least look at it. Yeah. And they're going to have a very visceral reaction to whether this is value added, whether it's good or whether it's super annoying. We all get annoying unsolicited texts all the time. Yeah. So the bar is really, really high and you have to really put yourself in your yeah. customer's shoes. And regardless of what the setting is, if you're texting somebody about an order that they made on Shopify, you should start from like, what is the best text that could possibly receive as a consumer? Like, well, that's and, a transactional. Right, right. Sure. So there's a difference between transactional and not transactional, but transactional. Yes. There can be some fear associated. I like this, this like, so say we have like a 30 minute YouTube video, the little yeah. segment of this would be called B2Bs are scared to send texts. Yeah, like totally. They could send them, but they're just scared. And I think that you're right. The fear is in like, well, you don't want to appear. You don't want to appear like you lack etiquette. Totally. Right? Like you don't want to send it on a Sunday and interrupt somebody's dinner. And then even that really well-written text and that really relevant text, like gets associated with an interruption at dinner time. Totally. It's poor etiquette in the B2B space. Right. Well, if it, 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 it in our space, everything has to be double opt in consent driven, you should bring that to the B2B space too, right? Like uh, if for people who are listening, who are um, in sales, for example, you know, everyone goes through a sales cycle. They have the, the discovery call where they're learning about the business and you're trying to set an agenda. If these things happen, then you and I, Mr. Prospect will agree to have a follow-up call about XYZ stuff. You can use those sorts of moments in the, in the B2B enterprise customer journey to make a suggestion. Hey, I'm super busy. I'm sure you are too. How is it okay if I communicate with you a little bit via text? I have your number here. Is that your number? It would say, yes. Great. I'm going to shoot you a text that you have mine. And if I can't reach you via email and there's something time sensitive, I might reach out here. Is that okay? If you had a good discovery call, they're going to say yes. And yeah. it'll radically increase the uh, likelihood that when you need to make an ask or communicate with your decision maker, that you're able to reach them where they are. So summarize um, that, summarize that yeah. for us again. So at the end of a good discovery call, you're basically yep. like, yo, could I send you a text real quick? And then you establish that back and forth text string with the salesperson one-to-one. -one. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. If you are done with the discovery call and you believe it went good, right? You're, if you're a good rep, you would know, was that a good call or a bad call? The call went generally good. You're going to have more calls. Just ask the prospect, Hey, I'm, I'm busy. I'm sure you are too. I have your number here. It's this number. Is it okay in time sensitive situation? If I shoot you a text here and there to make sure that we're, uh, working together in a timely way, 9.9 .9 times out of 10. The prospect will say, absolutely. You built some rapport with me. I'm totally fine with you shooting me a text here. And yeah. There. Or is Don't it cool if I shoot you a text, like once I've sent this thing that you've requested, just so like I can make sure it doesn't get drowned out in your. Yeah. And I think and, people and everybody are, would say yes. Yeah. If it, was, if it was a good disco call. Yes. Everybody would say yes. Especially with people working, you know, from home a lot now, um, we all have to be pretty respectful of people's communication styles. And I actually think if you build enough rapport with someone who you're trying to do business with and you say, look, I prefer to communicate over text. It's the way that you'll get the best communication out of me. Is it okay if I text you here and there yep. to make sure that we're moving things along? People are much more open to that now than they ever have been in, in the past. And yeah, totally. That's a really good formula, Mike. You're smart AF. <laughs> I'm like really tempted to say the actual words that AF stands for, but I don't want to like offend people, but you are smart AF, sir. Cause you're what, well, what you're saying is basically you'll have a better chance of getting a good response from your prospect. If you offer a little bit of information first about yourself and your mm -hmm. communication preferences, and then you ask about theirs, right? Like yeah, if you just totally. say, Hey, could I text you? You're going to get one response, but if you say, Hey, look, I'm busy. I'm drowning in email. I live or die by calendar. I'm a text person. Like, and I don't expect an answer immediately. Is it cool if I just text you? Is that okay? Like you're going well, to get it, a 90% yes versus like a 50% yes. Good disco the, call or bad. It could be a bad disco yeah. call framed correctly. And you would get that 
consent to text. Yeah. And there's also times where you need that channel to be open. And if you didn't open it up at the beginning of the cycle, you can't use it. A, a, a great example of this was um, when I worked at uh, Gainsight, um, our head of say our fiscal uh, Q3 ended on Halloween. Yeah. And we were trying to close deals deep into the evening and night. And our chief sales officer had the texting relationship with one of the key prospects we had. And he was literally taking his girls trick or treating and on the side, texting his key prospect to try to get this deal done. And we got the deal done. The prospect was also trick or treating with his family, but he was able to go pick up the DocuSign real quick. Sorry, my bad. I missed it. I'll sign it right now. If we didn't have the SMS communication channel open with that prospect, we couldn't have leveraged that. We would have been sending to his work email. He never would have seen right. it. Never would have seen it ever. So you, you want to have all of these tools available in your toolkit when you're trying to get, you know, a new deal done or renewal done, whatever it might be. And if you don't have the consent already built, then you should be scared to just fire off a random rogue tech to somebody. If you haven't asked them for it, you probably can't do it. So it's yeah. worth asking when you have the opportunity to do so because you had a good interaction where you added value you you built some rapport make the make the ask and if you make yeah. the ask then you'll have sms in your back pocket when you really really need it yeah make the ask and i think first explain your own communication style i think that was yeah. like a really like you know it might not get 100 likes on twitter or whatever that particular tip but by leading with, Hey, here's my communication style. What I like, is it cool if I do that with you too? Mm -hmm. I think your acceptance rate will be like 10 X higher. hundred percent. You know, have you heard about that study where it was like, people were trying to butt in line. They did a study no. about whether you could butt in line. So it's like, yo, so if somebody comes up, so the first group was asked to just go simply ask if they could get in front of somebody in line. And the response was highly negative. People would say, no, like you cannot get in front of me in line. The second group was instructed to say the word because, and then to provide a good reason. Can I get in front of you in line? Because I have a flat tire and I need to pick up my son and I just am. And overwhelmingly people said yes mm -hmm. in that study. The third study was the same group of people. And they were instructed to, to ask if I could butt in front of you in line to say the word because, and then to say something almost nonsensical after that. Like, can I butt in you in front of you in line? Because like my glasses are black and that's what, you know, say something like nonsensical, yeah. like not a good reason to butt. And their rate of yes, I don't know the exact numbers, was dramatically higher than just the people that didn't say because and provided no reason, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like in yeah, line wanna... with this sort of a thing of framing to get that consent is like to say, like, if you're just like, hey, is it cool if I text you? Some people might say yes, if it was a great disco call, right? But if you yep. say, hey, I'm a texter myself, I'm drowning in email, you know, all these things. Is it cool if I text you? Like if you provide that reason, or you could even follow the study and say, Hey, is it cool if I text you? Because my email is overwhelmed or my assistant's out of town or whatever it is. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, increase and, your consent rate. And, and the, you know, what we were talking about was a lot of the one-to-one -one sort of like sales and relationship building components of it. But like, you can use this in, in marketing too. Everyone is dealing with unbelievable amounts of information, stuff that you actually want to consume gets lost in the ether. Your inbox yeah. is crazy. In fact, a lot of people have like, you know, settings on their inbox now to make sure that this stuff doesn't get in there. So imagine, I'll just give you a basic example. Um, but like, imagine you have a, you know, really important newsletter or a really important, um, uh, See a blog series that you're publishing every week and the people who really like it want to read it and they want to get it every week. You could even ask people, is it okay on, on through like a pop-up on the site, for example, um, enter your, your, your cell number, uh, to get this delivered via text as soon as it's published, 
on this cadence, lots of people would prefer for things that they actually want, would give permission to be able to be texted when you're going to announce something. I, I when I uh, worked at uh, uh, Gainsight, we had a big event we did called Pulse, and we would have um, ticket sales. The prices of the tickets would go up at certain times, and we would offer different things at different times to try to drive engagement. We often talked about, well, we should give people the opportunity to sign up to get a tech when like the speaker lineup gets dropped or when we're going to like offer up the ability to select what sessions you want to go to because they're first come first serve. Anywhere where there's like a scarcity element or a time-based element, you can inject uh, SMS consent because for people who really want to digest that stuff, it, it's the best way to get it into their into their hands to complete pattern interruption. And for things that they want, I think this will surprise lots of folks. They're really, really willing to to get it if there's an exchange of value. The B2C version that everyone knows that works phenomenally is give us your uh, phone number and exchange for a 20% discount. That converts like 75% of the people who see that message. The B2B version of that is I have something of value, whether it's a blog post, a, uh, a pricing discount, a exclusive VIP offer of something that no one else can get. Give me your phone number so you can get the thing. You collect a lot more phone numbers than you think. Wow. So, so in the B2C world, retailer, e-com retailers are giving 25% off just in exchange to get that consent and that phone number. Yeah. What and you'll see is that yeah. at checkout that they offer that or is that because I see like when I'm shopping, I'll see like a box like, hey, sign up for our thing and get 10% off. Usually that's an email opt in. But are you saying at the checkout point is when they yeah. do that? So they'll they'll do it at a bunch of different points. Some people do uh, do it right when you land on the site. So Let's imagine you click an ad to go buy, you know, some t-shirt. You land on the site after you've been on the site for, let's say, you know, 10 seconds, you're clicking around, they'll serve you up with a pop-up that will, in exchange for a discount, ask for your email address and will ask for your phone number and SMS consent to be able to text you special offers and those sorts of things if you want this discount. Oh my God, dude, that is so powerful, man. It, it converts at a really, really high level and, you know, it, it, uh, it drives future sales because in the e-commerce world, uh, which is very different than, than B2B, but in the e-commerce world, the merchants are looking to do two things. One, they want to try to get first order profitability to pay off the cost of driving traffic to their site. So that first purchase someone makes needs to get close to paying off hundred percent of their cap to acquire it. Yeah. Once they've done that, then the second purchase is the really, really important thing. Cause that's when they start to make profit. Using and email that, that and CAC, that, and that cost of customer mm -hmm. acquisition would usually include the ad spend or just the ad spend mm -hmm. or ad spend plus also like a 1.6 times yeah. multiplier for what or whatever multiplier. Yeah. At, at it spend uh, um, cogs, so whatever it costs to make the product, so they bake and then also thing so discount that they maybe gave you to be able to incent, they bake all of that in. And so they're very, very aggressive because they need to be to make sure that the contribution margin is uh, strong on those first orders. That means the second order, the third order, the fourth order, the fifth order, that's where all of the profit is. That's where SMS can can be ridiculously powerful, which is why they're willing to give away a 20% discount to get the SMS consent up front because they know they can drive, you know, two through N sales there. And that's yeah. where they're making high margin uh, uh, dollars. And so if you think about that motion that the e-commerce folks use and try to apply it back to like a B2B marketing motion, and you just like swap out what the product is. You know, you do your CAC calculation and you use SMS to drive the ongoing engagement. There's a pattern there that creative and fearless B2B marketers could copy to drive really, really strong marketing engagement results if, if they wanted to. 
I love this topic. I'm like getting so excited. I just want to keep talking. But um, so if you're a B2B, and let me put you on the spot right now, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can tell me to cut, tell me to think about it, whatever. But if you're one of these B2Bs, right? And this is in a world where PostScript doesn't exist. Like you can't just say, hey, get PostScript. But if you're one of these B2Bs, and you know that SMS is so valuable because you can get right into their cell phone, like the most intimate thing. Like I have pictures of my kids on this thing, right? Mm -hmm. You can get into that cell phone, that uncrowded space, instead of that email box, that noisy, you know, blasphemous space that most people hate to even spend any time in. How do you go about that? Like, what's the first thing you do? Like, Mm -hmm. the, there's, the first, there's all these different steps. Go ahead. Yeah. You tell yeah, me. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, there's, so there's a couple of things. One, you need to make sure that you have the infrastructure for it. SMS for good reason is a highly regulated channel. And so you need to have the infrastructure to be able to collect SMS marketing consent and store it. So, you know, and it's defensible that this person gave you their number so you can text. So that's like the first, first start. Do you have the infrastructure to be able to text people at scale? That should be easy. Postscript does that for e free e-commerce merchants. There's tons of vendors who do that. So yeah. once you have let's, the infrastructure going. Yeah. Let's assume that that's they, taken care of. So CCPA yeah. and GDPR and all that shit. Yep. And the, uh. Well, I am interested in your take on the actual stack, like the sending stack that you might use in a B2B environment, but let's take that yeah. after. So let's assume that you've got all that, then what next? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the first thing I would challenge a B2B marketer to think about if they were going to go into trying to leverage SMS in a marketing context would be to think of what offers would make sense to exist on the channel. You cannot just port over your existing stuff or um, take a look at your email calendar and say, if we're going to send an email this day, let's just send an SMS with the same information to the same people. That won't work. What you need to do is find something that is of the highest order of value to your audience. And it's not for everyone. It's for a very specific group of people. And your goal should be to create something that has as enough value that people, a select group of people are willing to give you their, uh, SMS number to be able to, um, to be able to, uh, get that item. Uh, and it can be something simple. Um, like a checklist I, or a, yeah, a or spreadsheet. I, it could be almost like any lead capture, any sort of, uh, lead yeah, magnet. Yeah. But whatever instead of it is. rendering an email box, you render an SMS box. And I think half the people in this day and age might not even like think twice. They might just look at that and be like, okay, cool. I'll just my cell phone. That'll be easy. Cause a hundred percent, not everybody is nerdy like us, you know, like we're super nerdy. We're like, oh, is there an opt in? Like, am I, but for a There's lot of a... people, like if you're just like, Hey, put your, put your cell in here and I'll send you this useful asset immediately. Yeah. There's a really funny thing that marketers do. And I'm sure you've talked about this with other guests on the podcast. All marketers know this, um, which is we make everything way more complicated than it needs to be. We forget that this entire game is about humans marketing to other humans. If you have something valuable that someone wants and you can get it to them with less friction, with, with more speed. Um, in a exclusive way by lever leveraging scarcity to, to give them uh, the, the offer uh, and add value every step of the way, it's fine. People are used to communicating with other people and they use a bunch of channels to do that. SMS is a big one. And so I just think uh, people are, are always generally worried about um, what people are going to think or like, is it appropriate to text an executive at a, you know, publicly traded company about the RFP materials. And it's like, well, it's up for them to decide that they can get that a bunch of different ways. If you give them an option to onboard onto the SNS channel and that's their preferred way of getting the information, then good on you. Then you can start building a, a, a texting relationship with, with your best customers. And the, the benefit of that, the reason that like the juice is worth the squeeze there is because 
you know, they're going to read it and it's completely direct into their, into a channel where they're always, always available. And so I just think people, uh, it, it's a lot easier for people to come up with excuses about why they shouldn't do it. Um, than to think about all of the upside that could come with building SMS as a real channel. And I think all B2B marketers should be challenging themselves regularly to be thinking about what's the next frontier, what's the next way I can set my company up to be more successful, drive more engagement with their target market. And, you know, obviously I'm talking my book here, but, you know, I say, you know, sleep on SMS at your own peril. It's, it's, uh, it's the, it's the, it's the way that people communicate with the people that they care about most. Your brand earns the right to be there. That's a huge, huge win as a marketer. And, um, there's probably a lot of ways if you like let go of the natural constraints and, and the way that we tend to think, there's probably a lot of ways you can come up with something that would make a lot of sense on, on the SMS channel that your customers will actually really love. Yeah. Well, I want to talk about PostScript yeah. uh, in a minute, uh, but, but I want to, so say that you're a B2B before we get to PostScript mm -hmm. and I want you to yep. give me the full pitch there because every single feature and every single thing that you guys do, I'm basically going to like think about it in a B2B context or a B2C lead gen context. And, yep. and I'm telling you, that's where the best ideas come from. It's like, look at one industry that's ahead and I... And there's like gaming, like gaming is always ahead, right? Like they're going to mm -hmm. be the first to VR and AR, and they're going to be the first to really use AI. Like gaming is usually ahead. So we don't have any gaming clients, but I like to look at what they're doing with the gamification and like continue, yep. just buy five more coins. And um, so that's the context of this. If you're a B2B, you're bought in, so you're you're no longer scared of the text. Yep. You've figured out how to gain consent, right? You've mm -hmm. got the infrastructure in place. Like you've got that sending platform in place. You got some one-to-one -one stuff going on, like at the disco call level or at whatever, you know, sales funnel level. And you've also got some stuff going on really top of funnel, just like an exit intent pop-up that's like, the mm -hmm. same as your normal exit intent pop-up, but instead of asking for email, you're now asking for SMS and maybe, oh, prefer doing an email, like maybe like a little link at the bottom, like, oh, if you prefer email, like click here, whatever. Uh, what do you do from there? Like, how do you run this program? Like, what types of stuff do you send in a non-transactional way? This is all before the transaction. I just want your thoughts on that. Yeah. So like most things, I would probably start with at least a high level sort of like customer journey map so you can understand what touch points there are. And then any point where you think that there's some value to be created or, or some step that you want your customer to take, you can ask yourself the question, like, would this be better served over tech? I'll give you an example. Uh, um, a lot of people run free trials where they've want people to go in, start a free trial, click yeah. around, see what they think. There's a lot of companies that provide in-app um, walkthroughs to help people understand how to use the application. Here's a free yeah. idea. Those only work if they're in your app, logged in and looking at the screen. If instead, when someone started a free trial, you said, hey, give us your phone number. And what you'll get from us is over the course of your 14 day free trial, we'll text you a tip every day at 9 a.m to make your free trial as valuable as possible on how to use our product. One, regardless of whether they find it or not, you'll guarantee that they read it. Every step of every day that their free trial goes on, you'll end up top of mind and trigger them to go log in and use their trial more effectively, which gives more signal to your reps, more likelihood that you'll convert them into a customer later. Wow. All of that is better over tech because you're not limited by what they're doing on their computer at any time, because you know, you're getting the access direct on the phone. So, so that might be the, that might be the value bomb of this episode or the value bomb of some people's year, any PLG yeah. company, like anybody that's free trial led, basically it could be huge. So unpack that for me for, in like a minute. Yeah. I know we're running out of time, but like one minute. So, so your cat, you're asking for that. Uh, mm -hmm. that S that cell phone number, 
You may not get it sometimes, but for the people mm-hmm. that you do get it for, you will have way intimate access into it and and yeah. the signals. So unpack the signals. There's there's layers to that strategy that you just laid out. Yeah, well, everyone knows who's running a free trial that getting someone to start the free trial is only a very, very small portion of the battle. You want them to use it, get value, and then enter a sales conversation when it makes sense. And a lot of people drop off at every single stage of that trial for a whole range of reasons. But if you're able to uh, bring people back, regardless of what channel they're on, because you're able to have access to their phone, you can keep people moving along the funnel. You can also engage them when they fall off. And instead of sending an email that's going to go into, you know, the promotions tab somewhere or into the spam folder that says like, hey, you have six days left on your free trial. What, what's going on? You can instead text them and say, you know, hey, Mike, you have six days left in your free trial. Um, here's the thing that I think you're, you're missing out on. If you log in today, I'll extend your free trial by another six days. And then you can start to drive those sorts of engagement offers, keep the trial alive. Because that's really the one of the ways that you can really destroy your, your CAC as well. You're paying all this money to get people into the mix and you're paying for a certain cost per free trial. If those things aren't converting into actual paying customers, then you have to go spend that money again to get new people back to the funnel. So driving those conversions is really, really, really important. The, the, the framework, if I zoomed out, the framework that I would use to think about where to apply SMS, where it's better to do something on text versus email or in-app or whatever you might do, is to think about why SMS is valuable in the first place. It is the only channel that exists that is two-way automatically. You know, no one responds to your emails. Literally, people send emails that they don't reply at whatever. They, they, they specifically yeah. don't reply. Text isn't that way. It, it's two-way from the get-go. It's completely uh, mobile. It's with your, your customer everywhere that they are. And it doesn't matter if they are... Um, if they're on their computer or not, it's completely channel agnostic. They don't have to be on your site or in your app or on LinkedIn or Twitter or Instagram. They can be anywhere and you yeah. can still have an ongoing conversation with them and an engagement with them. And because of those reasons, that access level and the engagement level you can get from tech is really, really powerful. So anyone who's thinking about it, I'll go back to that customer journey I was talking about. Take that framework, look across your customer journey and think of any place where having that type of access would be not only better for your company, but a better customer experience. And that's where you should probably start experimenting with tech. Yeah. And there should almost be like a hard cutoff. It's like, if you progress down the sales pipe to this level, like if you Mm -hmm. enter deal stage equals this, like we almost have to get your text at that point. Totally. Cause I mean, you like can if imagine you become like, a customer, like we, sometimes we have like our clients, we like have to text them sometimes like the mm-hmm. credit card is not working anymore. The ads are down. Like we yeah. need an emergency access point at sometimes, you know, a hundred percent. I mean, even basic stuff like, um, you know, you have a, re- you're, you're a customer, you have a relationship with your CSM and the CSMs are always dealing with trying to make sure that they're getting you know, those biweekly or monthly calls going so they can drive strategy with the client. Like even integrating SMS into your meeting reminder process to make sure that you're getting people ready. Hey, I'm excited for a call this uh, this Friday at 9 a.m. It's Thursday at 9 a.m. Here's what we're going to talk about. Let me know if you have any questions and improving the show rate of the customers can have really big business impact down the way. That's brilliant, yo. That's brilliant. So I've had a lot of success with, I mean, just meeting reminders in general, like people mm-hmm. forget about meetings. Totally. You know? So I always, for the, since the beginning of time, I've always sent meeting reminders and for the most part manually. Now we have like the Calendly or mm-hmm. Chili Piper. Well, we use Chili Piper, but so that happens automatically via email. Mm-hmm. But how much more power, and it, and it actually works pretty well via email. Yeah, it totally does. But how much more powerful if it were via text? So if you get a, so I wonder, what is this? 
And this has been amazing, by the way. I have like a hundred questions. I want to know all about your background and stuff. Yeah. This has just been kind of like an impromptu uh, session, uh, which has been all value bomb and you've been dropping it unselfishly. And I, I appreciate that. Yeah, of course. Um, I do foresee a day and that, that basically all B2Bs lead with SMS. And here's why is because people change jobs, you know, people switch mm -hmm. jobs, people don't switch cell phones. Mm -hmm. So if, if indeed it's easy enough, like if you can run a test and say like, Hey, instead of your email for a free trial, like let's try your SMS. Just run like a thousand visitors through that test and see if the, the opt-in rate and the sign-on rate is the same. Because if it is, it could be a game changer. And I know because like we'll send any given email that we send, we'll get dozens of auto replies. Like this person's no longer with that company, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is ironic because we require a business email on the front end of our site. Like you can't like do our yep. contact request form with a Gmail. It's like, sorry, yep. like give us your business. So we require that, which in retrospect may not be that smart. Because when they switch jobs inevitably, which the average person does like every two or three years or whatever, mm -hmm. that becomes a bat or that becomes a, you know, a non useful email. So mm -hmm. if you could collect a cell phone number, which doesn't change, it's probably every seven or eight years on average, somebody changes that, that becomes really powerful. So I think like it's forward looking, it's it's uh it's unconventional it's new but i almost think that every b2b especially like a product-led b2b should almost be like yo like emphasize that sms on the front end and maybe there's a little link like if you have to sign up with an email like do it like that i don't know why they're not doing that or trying that it's probably because they're scared yeah people are scared and people just tend to think of b2b identity as being email because that's where you, you're like, you know, corporate signature, right? And, uh, but you're totally right. Like part of the reason why LinkedIn has been so successful is because they own the business identity. They, they beat Facebook at that. Yeah. And everyone, uh, I think, incorrectly assumes that the business email is the contact information that goes along with the business identity. But if you recognize how often people are moving jobs and people are doing all sorts of different things. The style is really the thing that's persistent and, uh, they're, they're super valuable. And I think also like, you know, part of what we're doing in whether you're B2B or B2C, if you're a marketer, you're trying to find alpha, right? You're trying to find, uh, something that you can do that'll make you stand out and get better results than your peer set. Um, that's what we're here to, to accomplish in a lot of ways is, you know, you could hire anyone you wanted to run your marketing team and get like basic results. You want better than basic results. You want uh, great results where you can go win and, and finding new innovative ways to, to do marketing is, is where you, where you get all of that. And, um, if I were still in B2B enterprise marketing, um, I would absolutely be trying to find out how I could get outsized results by doing something my peers weren't doing and SMS would be at the very, very top of my list. Totally. Totally. And B2Bs, we call it angles and cohorts and mm -hmm. cohorts being the key word there. They have many, many cohorts like, uh, like deals and pipe deals and mm -hmm. pipe on this stage, deals and pipe, closed loss deals and pipe team travelers, like people that have gone from multiple companies. So they have so many cohorts, even if you could just take one of those cohorts, one of those small cohorts, call it, call it any deal that enters like proposal stage. It's like, okay, cool. Here's how we do this. You give me this, that, and the other, let me grab your SMS. Let me grab your cell phone number just in case we have any questions. Cause I don't want it to get mm -hmm. drowned. Like captured at that one stage. And then you have this one list, this one SMS list. And I bet you that'll be the most responsive list in your whole marketing stack. Oh, totally. I, that's another really funny thing is like B2B marketers tend to be like, Hey, guess what? Like our open rate went from 18% to 18.8%. Our Q2 experiment was awesome. And it's like, we're just used to accepting 
these really arable engagement rates just because they're like the quote unquote benchmark. Yes. You can escape that completely by going to different channels and different models of communication. And so I think, you know, trying to battle the, how do I go from 16% to 18% on whatever channel you're trying to do personally, forget all that, go figure out how to go get a 90% open rate on a completely different channel. Do the hard thing, you know, zig when people zag. I'm I'm all about that. Speak, Mike, speak. Yes, do not accept 10% incremental improvements <laughs> like over a year. Try to double it, triple it. And in order to do that, you have to try weird shit. Yep. At the 100%. end of the day, you have to try weird shit. And I tell that to clients sometimes. Like sometimes when I'm pitching deals to clients, I'll be like, look, there's certain characteristics of clients for us. It's one, two, three, and four. And number four is like, you have to trust us and you have to let us find weird shit because otherwise we're going to wallow in mediocrity, you know, theoretically mm -hmm. forever. If we're just incremental all the time and just copying the B2B shit all the time, we have to try the B2C shit. 100%. Dude, this has been amazing, Mike. Like this has been probably one of the most useful and impromptu episodes that I've ever had. Ironically, because it's like you're a B2C guy. Um, or no, you're a B2B guy now turned B2C and you're, and you're giving us your insights. I love it. I wish you, we could talk for another hour. Um, but you've been unselfish in adding value. I want you to tell us, pitch us on PostScript. So there are, yep. I'm sure some, some e-coms watching this mm -hmm. and I'm sure pro chances are they're on Shopify. Tell us about PostScript. Tell us about mm -hmm. why it's better than all the competitors. What are you guys up to over there? Yeah, PostScript is an SMS marketing platform for Shopify customers. We have over 10,000 customers and um, we have specialized in the SMS marketing side of things. We've just launched a new product last week, which is called SMS Sales, which is literally a group of agents that we've trained by hand who intervene over text to help drive conversion for merchants. Um, we have the best strategy and the best service in the game. We are solely focused on the SMS channel, so we know more about it than anyone else. So when people ask me, why should I choose to partner with PostScript versus the other folks that are out there? I tend to ask them a question back, which is, if you are you interested in maxing out the amount of revenue that you can potentially get from SMS? If the yeah. answer to that question is yes, then there's no choice but PostScript. If you use PostScript, you will make more money over SMS as a Shopify customer than any other tool out there. Of course, we want everyone's business as much as we can, but where we really specialize is for people who want to be SMS first, we're the ones to partner with to scale uh, up to the, the upper limits and, and find the ceiling for everyone, his, his, their particular brand. So um, yeah. that's really where, where we stand out and where we differentiate ourselves. Um, yeah, and I think anybody that visits the website at postscript.io, I think that they'll get the feel and the and the personality and the vibe. Yeah. I love the headline. Say hello to your number one revenue channel. Yeah, that's a headline know. right there. That's a big <laughs> fiery headline with the big fire on the right. So I, we, I, we, we use that all the time. I too. love the messaging on the site. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, we, 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 we talk a big game, but we, we back it up. We tell people all the time, we want to make SMS their number one revenue channel. We tell them, Hey, look, we know that that sounds really ambitious, but don't you want to partner with someone who's shooting for that as the yeah. our goal, uh, as opposed to someone who's coming in and telling you like, yeah, maybe we'll drive a couple of extra conversions. Let's see what happens. No, we're going to put all of our resources, understand your brand as best we can to try to turn SMS into your number one revenue channel over email, over your ad platforms. Maybe yeah. we'll get there. Maybe we won't, but I guarantee you on part of that, on that journey, we will definitely max out the amount of money you're making over SMS than any of our peer set. And so, um, yeah, I love been, it. I love that. It's like, so when we write headlines, sometimes we think about fear versus greed, you know, fear mm -hmm. would be like, don't miss out on SMS. I yeah. love that. It's greed focused. Cause you don't see that a lot. Like say, yeah. look to your number. Um, I just love everything about it, man. That's. That's badass. So there's a lot of people listening right now. They were mm -hmm. expecting, I don't know what they were expecting, but what they got <laughs> was a masterclass in the future 
of B2B SMS, which is coming, folks, to a theater near you. It will happen. It may not be this year. It may not be the next year. But at some point, the B2Bs will realize how profitable SMS is on the B2C side and how accessible your clients and customers could actually be. That will happen. And then you'll listen back to this episode and be like, yo, Mike Mannheimer knew what was up. <laughs> So That's what Mike, I'm hoping for. people, of course, want to follow you. I know you're active on Twitter and uh, LinkedIn, uh, and they probably, I'm, I'm sure there's some Shopify merchants listening to this right now. Um, mm -hmm. What should they do? What do you want them to do? How do they learn more about you and PostScript? Yeah. Uh, PostScript.io is, is our website. You should definitely check it out uh, at, at, at minimum to examine the messaging and look and feel. We try to be fun out here. So. Um, check this out, postgroup.io. You can find me at Mike Manheimer on Twitter. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, Mike Manheimer again. I'm happy to connect uh, and talk SMS, B2B marketing, or whatever else you want to talk about anytime. Um, very open to to connecting with, with new folks. Cool. I'm going to call you like next week and basically show you like three or four of our clients, some B2B, some B2C, lead gen. Mm -hmm. and be like yo help us because this <laughs> this is like i mean it's their their results aren't suffering but it's like this could be a 10x type of an opportunity the way i see yeah. it yeah uh i i agree wholeheartedly and i i i think you're spot on that uh we're not sure when but sms is coming to be to be and when it comes it's going to be here in a big way and i always tell people this too when it happens you will wish that you started building your SMS list yesterday. So start thinking about how to get consent, get your customers and audience used to communicating with you over the channel, because when it becomes the primary channel, just like it was when, when email was, was coming up, you know, 15 years ago, you know, where your email list was everything, your SMS list is going to be everything. And uh, it will be yes, because, because cell phone numbers are much less disposable than email addresses mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's the fundamental fact that is like the you know the current it's like the tailwind of that of the space is that people just simply have us people just simply keep their cell phone numbers yeah and they have multiple emails like emails are disposable they have like like i have like chris's junk email at gmail.com yeah. you know? same I've had my same phone number since I was 17 years old and I'm not 17 years old now. Me too. Me too. Exactly. Cool. Well, this was awesome, Mike. Stay on the line for a minute, but, uh, for everybody listening, if you like this as much as I did, if you learned something, if you laughed a little bit, drop us a like, drop us a comment, send this to a friend. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, and until next time, we'll talk about, uh, driving revenue as a CMO. And that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us today. For show notes and other episodes, visit us at performancemarketinginsiders.com. This podcast is sponsored by Web Mechanics, the performance agency that makes you smarter, offering AI-driven search, paid social, analytics, and conversion rate optimization for financial services, health, B2B, and SaaS brands that know. Hey guys, exclusive for listeners of this podcast, you can get a performance marketing assessment for free. And this isn't some cookie cutter automated report. It lays out detailed, specific things you can do right now to unlock limitless growth and nirvana level personal satisfaction. To claim your free assessment, just go to performancemarketinginsiders.com slash audit and you'll have your customer report within just a few days. 